Great morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Leila, and I'm a PhD student at Boston University. Today, I'm going to talk about our work on a chisel-based programmable hardware monitor. This presentation is based on our paper that is going to be published in uh, Using Security Conference at 2020. Well, before diving into the details of our project, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the background and history of this project. Uh, I'm part of Western University's Integrated Circuits and Systems Group, or BOICSG, and we are working on a variety of research projects. Some of us is more interested in computer architecture. And typically, we are very interested in providing a practical back uh, and end-to-end -end solutions in our re uh, research projects. And we like to be able to evaluate our designs on realistic workloads. This has been a challenge before, but then the risk drive environment provided us with a great opportunity to actually be able to not to just build the hardware, also provide the operating system support for our hardware, and then have the application layer support for it so we can have an end-to-end -end system. Uh, when we started to uh, work on this project, there were a variety of uh, RISC-V processors available. And at that point, Rocket was the most mature one, being able to boot up Linux. And on top of that, it had the ROC interface. So we could design a piece of hardware connected uh, to the Rocket chip through the ROC interface and then boot up Linux on it and have a full uh, system. Uh, and since Rocket is written in Chisel, we started using Chisel in our uh, project. And the good news for us was uh, Chisel is a high-level programming language, and it has all of these open source libraries available. So when I want to design the hardware, I don't need to start from the scratch. I can use the available libraries, and that makes my life easier because I can spend more time on the other aspects of my project. For example, providing the software support for my design. But uh, what did I want to do that we, I needed all of these support for? Uh, in my research, I'm, research, I'm interested in um, hardware security. And I'm sure all of you have noticed that these days, security attacks are literally everywhere. We hear from time to time news about uh, hacked bank accounts or stolen SSNs SSN, or even cases where people's information and data are locked away until they pay ransom. All of these seem very scary, but not all the hope is lost because security researchers and security experts, they typically come up with software solutions and software patches to prevent these attacks and pro uh, protect against them. But interestingly, in recent years, there has been a growing trend in the industry to enforce some of the security policies in hardware. A successful implementation of security policies in hardware, such as non-executable bits, can provide a permanent solution against a specific kind of attack without the need uh, for software patches and also with much lower performance overhead. Uh, so this sounds great, but it's a very difficult and costly process to implement security policies in hardware. Let's take a look at an example. I'm sure all of you know that a programming language like C, it has uh, memory safety issues. And people have been trying to address this problem since a long time ago. Uh, there has been um, papers, academic papers, even in 1994, trying to address the memory safety issue, issue of uh, C using software methods. And even by 2008, we had uh, academic papers that, prov that were providing hardware-based approaches for uh, securing uh, the memory safety issues in uh, C programming language. Finally, in 2013, Intel decided that they're going to address this problem in hardware, and they said that they're going to include Intel MKX in hardware. That was the great news, because finally we could address the memory safety issue, or at least a spatial memory safety issue in hardware. By 2015, uh, Intel MPX was commercially available in processors, but things didn't really go as we expected. People started uh, looking into Intel MPX and they realized that it has performance issues and it doesn't work with all of the binaries, so, or all of the uh, uh, legacy code. So by 2018 and 19, 
Uh, LLVM, GCC, uh, Linux, they all announced that they're going to stop supporting Intel MPX because of all of these issues. As you can see, this is a very complicated process. And even if the, the uh, hardware implementation of security policies, even if it works, what if then uh, security attacks evolve? Then we still have the same solution in hardware and it cannot protect against new attacks. But um, what if we could have a flexible hardware implementation that could enhance and enforce a variety of security policies as security threats evolve? That is exactly what we are trying to do in our proposal of a programmable hardware monitor that we call it PHMON. PHMON is a piece of hardware connected to the rocket chip through the rock interface and then we provide the operating system support and application layer support for communicating with it. Uh, this figure on the bottom shows the general overview of how PHMON works. As a first step, uh, a user or admin uh, can program PHMON to look for specific execution trace patterns that we call them events during the program execution. When PHMON is enabled, it uh, continuously looks for those program events and then it takes a series of actions that are against uh, PHMON's programs for it. And it does this over and over until uh, the program is terminated or PHMON is disabled. Uh, but uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about uh, how we have designed our hardware and software support to actually be able to do this, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can actually use it. Well, at the hardware level, we want to know what is going on during the program execution uh, at the hardware. Uh, we want To do this, we want to collect the program execution trace. And uh, for that, we are minimally modifying the last stage of the pipeline in the rocket core to collect uh, information that we call it commit log. This information includes what instruction got executed, what was the program counter of the instruction that got executed, what will be the next value of the program counter, or if the current instruction has an address and uh, corresponding data, what are those values. We send all of these information uh, to PHMON through a minimal modification to the rock interface. And PHMON consists of uh, several match units or MUs. Each match unit is actually looking uh, for a specific monitoring uh, pattern that the user has specified. For example, we might be looking for specific uh, instructions, let's say call instructions, or we, want, we might want to actually uh, look for a specific address during the program execution. We can program PHMON to do that. And whenever a match unit finds a match, uh, then we take a series of following follow-up actions that the user has, uh, again, programmed PHMON to do so. For example, we can do ALU operations, or we can send a memory request to the L1 cache through the ROC interface, or we can even trigger an interrupt, and the operating system will handle it. Well, to be able to use this hardware, we needed to provide the software support for it. And we took advantage of the RISC-5 custom instruction to do so. We provide a list of C functions that the user can use for communicating with uh, PHMON and programming PHMON. Here, for example, so you can see two simple pieces of code that a user can use to uh, configure PHMON or trigger a conditional interrupt. But uh, having a software API is not enough. If we want to be able to do per process monitoring, we need to provide the operating system support for our hardware. And to do this, we modify the task struct in the Linux kernel to store PHMON's information, and we maintain this information during context switches. And on top of that, uh, we uh, modify the interrupt handler in the kernel. Uh, first, we um, Whenever we have uh, an interrupt from the ROC interface, we delegate this machine level interrupt to the operating system level, and uh, we modify the uh, interrupt handler to take care of the ROC interrupt, for example, by terminating the violating process or by uh, trapping into the GDB according to the use case that we have. Um, so uh, 
As you can see, we have a simple hardware, we have uh, the full software stack around it, but how can we actually use it for something useful? It's very simple and easy to adopt PH1 for different use cases, and in our paper, we show that through four different use cases, a shadow stack, a hardware accelerated fuzzing engine, uh, prevented in preventing information leakage, and uh, accelerated debugger. During the limited uh, time that I have today, I'm only going to talk about two of these use cases. Let's start with the shadow stack. I'm sure all of you know that a simple stack overflow vulnerability can lead to code injection and return-oriented programming attacks or ROP attacks. And a possible solution against uh, ROP attack is using a shadow stack. A shadow stack is basically a secondary stack that uh, keeps track of the, only the function return addresses. And this way, even if the main stack gets corrupted, then we, uh, the shadow stack can detect uh, if there is a mismatch between calls and return semantics. And um, it's very simple to program PHMON to act as a shadow stack. To do this, we only need two match units. One match unit can monitor uh, the call instruction, and then whenever it sees a call instruction, it just needs to write the PC source of that call instruction into a shared memory region allocated by uh, operating system as a user space memory. And then uh, when another match unit uh, can monitor the return instruction, and whenever it finds a return instruction, it reads the last value written on the shadow stack, compares it with its uh, destination PC, and if there is a mismatch, it means that there is a mismatch between calls and returns, so something went wrong, it triggers an interrupt, and uh, the operating system terminates the uh, process. Well, uh, to make sure that this simple implementation actually works, we wrote uh, some simple program programs vulnerable to buffer overflow, and uh, we chose the inputs to this program in a way to make sure that we can take advantage of these vulnerabilities and then execute arbitrary code. And when we were using PH1, PH1 was actually able to detect the mismatch between calls and returns. It triggered an interrupt and terminated the process as expected. And then to make sure that uh, this design is actually um, efficient, we evaluated the PH1 performance overhead on a set of uh, benign benchmarks, including spec 2000, 2006, and Mi bench. And on average, PH1 had less than 1% performance overhead. And in literature, uh, people usually have uh, shadow stacks with 0.5% over performance overhead to 20%, uh, depending on how it has, has been implemented. So PH1 is effective to work as a shadow stack. Then we started to look into another use case, which was uh, hardware accelerated fuzzing. Uh, fuzzing is the process of providing a program under test with random inputs and corner case inputs with the goal of finding bugs and potential vulnerable securities. And all the big companies like uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they all use fuzzing extensively and continuously. Uh, for example, uh, Google has an OSS Fuzz platform, and it was able to find over 1,000 bugs in five months uh, for open, famous open source uh, software. And it's not like that they stop fuzzing after five months. It's a continuous process. So it's very important if we can actually improve the performance of fuzzing. And to do so, we started looking into American Fuzzy Loop, or AFL, which is a state-of-the-art fuzzer, and it has an instrumentation suit. Whenever the source code is not available, AFL depends on QMU for instrumentation. So uh, what the AFL tries to do is, try, uh, is finding new execution uh, paths during the uh, program execution, and uh, to do so, uh, it uses QMU to collect the code coverage information and then write it into a shared memory region. And because QMU is a software emulator and it uses uh, dynamic binary instrumentation, uh, it has a high performance overhead. That's where PHMON comes into the picture. PHMON can collect the code coverage information without that high overhead, and in this way it can improve the performance. And uh, we evaluated uh, PHMON uh, integrated AFL 
over a range of benchmarks from the AFL website, and we showed that uh, on average we improved the performance by 16 times, while our hardware design only has 5% power overhead and 13% area overhead. So it's really useful for fighting. These were the only use cases that I wanted to discuss today. But uh, before uh, concluding my talk, uh, I want to talk a little bit about my own experience as a graduate student using Chisel. Well, um, it, was a, uh, it was an exciting news for me that we have uh, an efficient high-level object-oriented programming language for describing hardware. And it has all of these open source libraries that we can use in our design. But uh, when I started learning Chisel, I felt like there is a gap between the tutorials and actual coding. For example, I went over the uh, wiki page in the GitHub. I read uh, those instructions and tutorials, and I felt confident that, OK, now I can write Chisel. And then I started looking at the rocket, and I was like, mm, I'm confused. I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, I admit that uh, over the years, this gap is becoming narrower and narrower, thanks to all of you. And I think um, the new Chisel website that Adam was describing in the morning, uh, it's really going to help students like me to be able to use it more efficiently. But I still feel like that the testing environment is also difficult for someone like me. Um, and another thing was that um, there is not that many documentations and comments in the open source code. Uh, some of you are experts in Chisel. You look at the code, it's obvious for you what's happening. But uh, for someone like me who is a graduate student, it's, if we have more comments in the code, it's going to be really helpful to understand and learn how to code in Chisel. Um, well, to conclude this talk, uh, we have a hardware monitor with full so uh, software stack, and you can easily adopt it for different use cases. Uh, and our paper is going to appear in um, Unix Security 2020 conference. Uh, also, our work has been artifact evaluated by the Unix Security community, meaning that they were able to reuse our design and validate our results. Uh, our code and scripts are uh, available in GitHub. We also provide uh, the BBL for each of our use cases if you're interested in running them uh, on Zboard FPGA. And that's it. Thank you.